I am old. Can anybody recognize who these two players are? Yes. And? And Magic Johnson, very good. So one of the best rivals. So Bird and Magic, you know, again, whenever possible, try to use colors, try to use good labels to so quickly look at what's going on. You know, Bird was a Celtic, so I would use green for him. Magic was a Lakers, so I'd use yellow. I could do piece of B for Bird and piece of M for Magic. I'll use P and Q. So P is the probability Bird gets a basket, Q is the probability Magic gets a basket. And we will assume that they never tire and they always shoot with the same probability. And we want to calculate what is the probability that Bird wins, like almost everything in mathematics, let's call it X. And we want to calculate what X is. All right. So let's break it up into cases. What's the probability Bird wins on his first shot? P. So Bird wins on his first shot with probability P. What's the probability Bird wins on his second shot? So what must happen if Bird is going to win on his second shot? Magic. They must both miss and he must make it. So what's that probability? Almost. 1 minus P times P. You've got magic. Times 1 minus Q. I'm going to write it as 1 minus P, 1 minus Q times P. What's the probability Bird wins on his third shot? What must happen? Yeah, I'm going to write it as 1 minus P, 1 minus Q, 1 minus Q, 1 minus Q times P. Miss, 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 miss. Yes. And in general, to win on your nth shot, you have to have N minus 1 misses by each, and then Bird makes it. Well, if we let R be 1 minus P times 1 minus Q, then the probability Bird wins is just P plus RP plus R squared P plus R cubed P, and so on and so on and so on, or it's just P times the geometric series. So if we knew the geometric series formula, we would now know the probability that Bird wins. If we don't know the geometric series formula, we can actually use this basketball game to derive the geometric series formula. So we proved it initially by doing you know, a clever telescoping sum. We multiplied by R, subtracted, got a lot of cancellation, took a limit. Let's look at the problem another way. So, so much of mathematics is all about finding the right way to look at something. So we're going to find the probability that Bird wins without using the geometric series formula. So of course, Bird could make the first shot, and Bird wins with probability P. Now imagine that Bird and Magic both miss their first shots. And now Bird has the basketball. He's about to shoot. At this point in time, what is the probability that Bird wins? No. P is the probability that Bird gets the next basket. That's not what I asked. What did I ask? I did not ask what's the probability that Bird makes his next shot. I asked what is the probability from this point onward that Bird wins? What is that probability? This is probably the hardest question of the whole semester. You, you have to tell me very concretely, explicitly, what is the probability Bird wins from this point onward? Okay, but what have we called that whole thing? We've given it a name. The name's on the slide right now. X, right? X is the probability that bird wins. Once they both miss their first shot, it's like the first shot never happened. What's the probability Bird wins from this point onward? X. Which would you rather do, an infinite sum? Well, I'd much rather do a finite sum. We now have X equals P plus 1 minus P, 1 minus Q times X. Oh, we can solve for X. So we'll call 1 minus P, 1 minus QR. We bring it over. We get 1 minus R times X equals P, where X is P over 1 minus R. So have we just proven the geometric series formula? That as long as r is less than one in absolute value, the sum is just one over one minus r. Have we proved that? What must be true about r for this problem? r is equal to one minus p times one minus q. 
And so what are the possible values for R? Does it have to be greater than zero or less than one? Well, it could be zero. You know, if either P of Q is one, then R could actually be zero. So it's possible R could be zero. What would it mean for R to be one? What's the only way R could equal one? P and Q are both zero. Oh, gee. So what? <laughs> so P and Q are both zero. So none of them would ever win. Uh, well, actually, if we take P and Q to be zero, the formula be, would become zero over one minus zero. Okay, actually, oh yeah, but R would be one, so you get zero over zero, which is undefined. Good. I actually like the fact that it's giving me an undefined in a situation like this. I really don't want to tell me who's going to win when neither one can win. When my brother and one of his friends were very young, they had a you know, Apple baseball game where you could make your own players. And my brother, I think, made the ultimate pitcher who strikes everybody out. His friend made the ultimate batter who always got a home run. And they faced off. And it took the computer a significant amount of time before it finally came up with what I believe is the only reasonable outcome. Anybody want to guess? Well, so it had to do something. So the pitcher always strikes everybody out. The batter always hits a home run. What did it decide happened? How many bases do you get when you get a home run? How many bases do you get when you get out? What do you think the computer said? Double. Yeah, so uh, amazingly, the computer gave him a double, which is, I think, a really phenomenal fact that the computer was able to say, yeah, yeah, let's make it a double. Whenever you have a formula, should be extreme cases. Is this reasonable? Good. When R equals one, I should not be able to say who's winning and the formula breaks down. It's excellent, excellent, excellent. The problem is this only works when R is between zero and one. When we did the algebraic proof of the geometric series formula, that proof worked for any R less than one in absolute value. So this doesn't deal with negative R's. It doesn't deal with complex R's. If you want for extra credit, you can modify this problem so that it will also work for negative R's. You have to do a little bit of algebra. But when we interpret R as a probability, it can't be negative. So you just need to be aware of what are the issues when you're doing this. All right, so the main thing going on here is that we have a memoryless process. And that's what is so you know, wonderful about something like this is that you know, with a memoryless process, as soon as certain things happen, it's like we reset the game. Anybody ever played chess? So in chess, if you have a threefold repetition of the board position, it's a draw. So it's not enough to just know where the pieces were on the board. You need to know what all the moves have been up until that point in time if you're going to truly analyze the game because you have to make sure you avoid uh, repetitions. Okay, any questions about uh, geometric series? Formula? Okay, let me see if I can now go back and share. Okay, good. All right, so we've discussed the geometric series formula. So what I want to do now is I want to move to Taylor series. And to some extent, we've already seen a little bit of Taylor series. And we've seen it with tangent lines. And so what we had is we had you know, some function, say you know, y equals f of x. We have some point a. And then we have, this is the point a comma f of a and the slope. What's the slope of the line that's tangent at that point? The derivative of A. And so the tangent line, we use you know, point slope. We get y minus f of A is f prime of A x minus A. Or y is f of A plus f prime of A x minus A. So this is the start. This is the initial speed. This is the elapsed time. Oh, 
Interesting. All right, so let me. Okay. So we just rewrote the tangent line and we just moved the f of a over to the right hand side. And now we can view this as the tangent line starts off at f of a. That's where you start at time a. f prime of a is your instantaneous speed. And then x minus a is the elapsed time. So if you're traveling at a constant speed, there's going to be no error. If your speed is changing, then of course you would expect there to be some error. And the question is just how much. And you know, eventually, you know, we might actually spend a lecture trying to quantify just how close you are. And typically your error is going to involve one derivative greater than the largest derivative you're using. So here we're just using the instantaneous speed at time A. So the error would depend on the second derivative. What is the second derivative? If the first derivative is speed, second derivative is, is what? Acceleration. Does anybody know what the third derivative is? Well, the, the inflection points come from where the second derivative is zero. I believe the third derivative is, is called the jerk. You know, it's the rate of change of the acceleration. So it shouldn't be surprising that typically the more information I know about a function at a point, the better I understand what's going on in the loop. Or if, even if it's the same prediction, the more accurate and more comfortable I am with that prediction. So this is using the best fit line. What could we use instead of the best fit line? Best fit parabola. And then building on the success for the best fit parabola, we could do best fit cubic and quartic. The more you use, the harder it is. We saw an application of the tangent line. Where do we see an application of the tangent line? So this is when we did Newton's method to find roots. Did we do that in this class? So to try to find your where a function hits the, the x-axis, where does it have a zero? We approximated it locally by a line, so where the line hit, and called that our next guess. And then we just did the allow the rinse repeat method. You could say, well, what if instead of using the best fit line, what if I used a problem? Would that get me something better? Now, what's nice about Newton's method is you stay with the rational numbers. And so if you use the quadratic, things would get more complicated. And Newton's method is already converging very rapidly. Every iteration doubles the number of decimal digits you have correctly. All right, let's be adventurous and try to move on to the next slide. All right. And so we'll talk about a general Taylor series. I'm going to do at the point a equals zero, for the more general point you do x minus a rather than a. Okay. So we'll do at a equals zero and have x to the n more generally it's x minus a to the n. So the nth Taylor series of f is going to be f of 0 plus f prime of 0 x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial x squared plus dot 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 plus. And then we put the nth derivative in a parentheses like that at 0 over n factorial x to the n. So this is a new function. What do you think the value of this function is at zero? So when I take x equals zero, what do I get? Zero. No, not quite. Almost, but not quite zero. When I take x equals zero, what do I get? I get f of zero, because all the terms with an x vanish, and I just get zero. Now I could take the derivative of t and f. Well, if I take the derivative, what's the derivative of f of zero? f of zero is a constant, so what's the derivative of f of zero? It's just going to be, it's the derivative of a constant. What's the derivative of a constant? 
zero. Now I take the derivative of f prime of zero x. What's the derivative of f prime of zero x? f prime of zero is a constant. So what's the derivative of f prime of zero times x? Not zero. What's the derivative of f prime of zero, which is a constant, times x? F prime of zero. It's just f prime of zero, right? The derivative of x is one. The derivative of five x is five, the derivative of eight x is eight. So this is typically confusing for students. You know, I have f as a function, but it's being evaluated at zero. Its derivative is evaluated at zero. So it's a constant now. So it's just going to be f prime of zero. Now the next term, I have f double prime of zero of two factorial times x squared. What would that be? So what about f double prime of zero of two factorial? What is that? Is that a constant or does that change with x? It's a constant. So what's the root of x squared? 2x. So I'm going to write the next term as f double prime of 0, 2 factorial times 2 times x, all the way to the last one, which is the nth derivative at 0 times n over n factorial times x to the n minus 1. Isn't that the second term? Wouldn't it just be f prime of 0 times x? I'm sorry? Like a, I don't want to simplify. Oh, okay. And now when I plug in x equals zero, what do I get? Not f of zero. F prime of zero. And now if I take another derivative at x, What's the derivative of f prime of zero? So I have to look at t and f prime. What is the derivative of f prime of zero? It's a constant. So what's the derivative of a constant? It's zero. Now I have f double prime zero times two over two factorial times x. So what's the derivative of that? It's just a constant times x. What's the derivative of x? So you just get the constant. So it's going to be f double prime of 0 times 2 times 1 over 2 factorial plus dot 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 plus the nth derivative at 0 times n n minus 1 over n factorial x to the n minus 2. And now you can see why I didn't want to cancel things. I have 2 times 1 over 2 factorial. It's going to cancel perfectly. And when I plug in zero, what do I get? So what's the second derivative going to be at zero? It's just f double prime zero. Everything else cancels. So this agrees with f of x for the first n derivatives at x equals 0. I've only done the first two, but you can just keep going like this. And so the whole point of the Taylor series is I'm coming up with a polynomial approximation that agrees with my original function and it agrees not just by having the same value at the key point, but the same derivative, the same acceleration, the same jerk, and so on and so on and so on. And the hope is that as we take more and more terms, as we take a higher and higher degree polynomial, it's going to do a better and better job approximating. Okay. So what I did over here is I did a program to try to plot uh, Taylor series approximation for cosine. And so I have a couple of things I can control. So x naught is the point that I'm looking at. N is the number of terms in my Taylor series that I'm doing. And then the C is just allowing me to you know, zoom in or zoom out. So you know, I can zoom in a little bit more if I wanted to. 
And so you know, this is the first order Taylor series approximation. And your cosine at zero is one. That's why it's starting off at one. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. And what's the derivative? And so what's minus sine of zero? Zero. So minus, so that gives you a first order Taylor series that is just the identical function y equals one. I could then add another term and I could look at the second order Taylor series. And that's not going to give me a problem. And so I can zoom in a little bit and see how good of a job it's doing. So is that a pretty good job, yes or no? We're approximating cosine as one minus x squared over two. You know, when you do the calculation, you get one minus x squared over two. If you look at this, for what values of x would you say that this is pretty good? So you think it goes all the way between negative two and two, you think it's a good job. So definitely I think if you're going to you know, really small range, 0.05, you know, we can't really tell the difference at this step. Let's move it you know, back a little bit. And so this is going almost to a little bit past 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5. In that range, you know, around 0.6, I'm beginning to see a discrepancy. But even at 0.5, it's looking pretty good. Do you think cosine can be approximated by a quadratic polynomial for all values of x? Why not? Yeah the, yeah, the quadratic is going to go down to infinity. And we know sines and cosines live between minus 1 and 1. So this has to get bad. And so as we zoom out a little bit, we can see, oh, yeah, it's getting bad. So you know, there's definitely a range where it does a decent job. So rather than just doing two coefficients, we could do three coefficients, right? There's no change. And the reason there's no change is when you take derivatives of cosine, it alternates between sines and cosines, right? And so all the odd terms are going to count on evaluating sine at zero. So all the odd terms are zero. So the third order Taylor series expansion is actually the same as the second order Taylor series expansion. So rather than doing the third order, I should do the fourth. And so that would give me you know, the best picture for two. And now, if you look at it, it's actually doing a much better job over a larger region. And so if I zoom back in a little bit, um, definitely between minus 0.6 and 0.6, it's working. You know, well past minus 1, 1, it's working. It's feeling around now minus 2, 2. And I really only have to go from, you know, minus pi to pi. And then that would give me a whole cycle of cosine. So rather than doing the fourth order, I should next try the sixth. And now, looking at the sixth, you know, if I zoom out a little bit, okay, it's getting a little bit better, but not so great. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. Now it's going in the right direction. It's getting a little bit further. But I need some time to go to the maybe 12th order. And here's the 12th order. I'm basically now going from minus pi to pi, and it looks wonderful. You know, if I zoom out, like this. Yeah. It's not doing a great job when I go beyond minus pi pi, but who cares? You know, I'm never going to evaluate sines and cosines outside of minus pi pi. I can always assume my argument is in there. But I can take more and more terms. I could take 20 terms. And if I take 20 terms, you know, I can see I'm now getting more cycles. If I take even more terms, 40 terms, 
I'll zoom out a bit, and you look at how far it's going. So this hopefully gives you just some appreciation of Taylor series, is we can now replace complicated functions with much simpler polynomials, and we can develop tools that allow us to tell how close they are. Yes? Um, so when you say like the first order, does that just mean the value of x is like one? Yes, it, it's how many, it's the highest degree of x you're taking in the expansion. Okay. So degree one, you only have an x term. Degree three, you have an x cubed term. Yes? Yes, the only thing that changes is the value of the derivatives at the point you're looking at. So for different functions, you know, you have to calculate the end oh, derivative. Right. Yeah, that, that's where it comes into play, exactly. So I might have occasionally mentioned this function in class, e to the negative one over x squared. Have we talked about this function? Okay, this is either the best or the worst function in all of mathematics. Functions like this should not exist. Or they make life interesting, depending on the point of view you want to take. So here's a plot of it. If you think about what's going on, you know, zoom in a little bit. I have e to the negative 1 over x squared. If x is really small, like 1 over 1,000, x squared is 1 over a million. So 1 over x squared would be a million. So e to the negative million, that's going to be an extremely small number. So as x is getting closer and closer to 0, this function is really decaying to 0. You know, let's zoom in a little bit more. Keep zooming in, keep zooming in, keep zooming in. You know, look at that. I'm now going between minus 0.2 and 0.2, and I've got things of size you know, 10 to the negative 11 for the size of the function. Um, doesn't really want to let me zoom in any further, uh, but let's see if I can cheat a little bit. You know, at, at this point, I can't even really distinguish it. Um, I tend to the negative 41. Okay. This function is small. As a nice exercise, oh, I love how it says uh, the number is too small to represent as a normalized machine number. Precision may be lost. And you get a little red warning sign. This function is extremely small. It turns out if you calculate all of its derivatives at the origin, every derivative is zero. And so let me see if I can shift back and clean the screen. So the hope is that if I take a Taylor series, the Taylor series should converge. So the hope as n goes to infinity, t n f of x converges to f of x, right? That should happen. That is, you take more and more terms, you should get closer and closer and closer to your function. You're at least if f is nice. And unfortunately, if we let f of x equal e to the negative 1 over x squared if x is not 0, and 0 if x equals 0, then as a nice exercise, you can show every derivative is zero. So tn f of x is always zero, only agrees in the limit with f of x at x equals zero. And that's really not impressive because we define the Taylor series to be f of zero plus a multiple of x plus a multiple of x squared plus a multiple of x cubed. Of course I agree with my function at zero. I force it to agree at zero. That's the only place where it agrees. So this example shows you that you have to be careful with Taylor series. That assuming that the series converges is hard. Assuming that the series then converges to the original function is even harder. So we just spent an entire unit talking about when do series converge? You know, when does a sum converge? We're in a situation where the sum converges. 
So the Taylor series, you know, again, you know, TNF of X is the sum n goes from zero to n of the nth derivative at zero over n factorial times x to the n. So for our example, the series converges. It just doesn't converge to the original function. So the big questions So one, does TNF of x converge as n goes to infinity? And two, if yes, converge to a function. So those are the big questions. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about a couple of famous Taylor series. And so one of them we've already seen. Famous Taylor series. So the first is e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus dot 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 equals the sum and goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. If we use the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? Then if f of x equals e to the x, what's f prime of x? e to the x. So what's f of 0? What's f prime of 0? f double prime of x would also be, and so f double prime of 0 would also be, and so this just, so if you know that the exponential function equals its own derivative, well, if you say, hey, let's look at this special function that equals its own derivative. You know, we'll, we'll just write it as e to the x. Then it turns out that this is going to be its series expansion. And so all the n derivatives are going to be 1, and that's why you have x to the n over n factorial. Because what we can really do is we can really view this as 1 times x, 1 times x squared, 1 times x cubed, and so on and so on and so on. So the ones are really there, they're just not very visible. Okay. How many of you have seen e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta? They seem, sometimes they write this as cis theta in high school, cosine i sine. So if f of x is cosine x, what's f prime of x? Negative sine of x, f double prime of x, f triple prime of x, positive sine of x, and then the fourth derivative, we switch to Roman numerals. And so f of zero is just going to be one f prime of zero is going to be zero, f double prime of zero is minus one, f triple prime of zero is zero, and then the fourth derivative is one. So at this point you should notice it's periodic with period four. Periodic, period four. So it's going to go cosine of x is going to be 1, and there's no x term, and it's going to be minus 1 times x squared over 2 factorial, no x cubed term, plus 1 times x to the fourth over 4 factorial, no x to the fifth term, minus 1 times x to the sixth over 6 factorial, plus 1 times x to the eighth over 8 factorial, minus, and so on and so on and so on. This is going to be the expansion for cosine. Okay? And it's just going to keep repeating. Basically, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. I'm not going to do it 
but you know, similar analysis gives you sine of x is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7th over 7 factorial, and so on and so on and so on. Right. What does, if, um, if I is or am the square root of negative 1, what is i squared? Negative 1. What's i cubed? Negative i, right? Because i cubed is i squared times i, so it's going to be minus i. What's i to the fourth going to be? One. What's i to the fifth going to be? I. So you know, notice that again, periodic with period four. Where have we seen something periodic with period four? Yeah, previous slide, right? Huh, I wonder if there's a connection. I wonder if maybe that's why Miller was writing e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So this is the relationship between sines and cosines and exponentials. So let's consider e to the i x. This is going to be the sum n goes from zero to infinity of i x to the n over n factorial. So this is going to be the sum n is even i x to the n over n factorial plus the sum n is odd i x to the n over n factorial. I, well, for the even ones, I can write this as maybe m goes from zero to infinity, I'll have i to the 2m, x to the 2m over 2m factorial. And for the odds, I can write, and my first odd is going to be the number one. So I can write maybe n is you know, 2k plus one. So here I'm doing n equals 2m. Here I'm going to do n equals 2k plus 1. Or maybe I want to do 2k minus 1. I'll do 2k minus 1. So I'll do a sum. k goes from 0 to infinity of i to the 2k plus 1 x. I'm oh, sorry, minus 1. x to the 2k minus 1 over 2k minus 1 factorial. No, I'm not sorry. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I do one half of this plus one. Because when, when k equals zero, and I now get one. So I do one half of this plus one. Okay. Well, let's look at what's going on here. i to the 2m is the same as i squared to the m. Right? So i to the 2m is i squared to the m is negative 1 to the m. So this is just going to be the sum, m goes from 0 to infinity, of negative 1 to the m, x to the 2m over 2m factorial. And now for the second one, notice I have an i to the 2k plus 1. I can pull an i outside. And then I'll have a sum k goes from 0 to infinity. I have i to the 2k. OK, so that's going to be negative 1 to the k, x to the 2k plus 1 over 2k plus 1 factorial. This is just sine of x. And this is just cosine of x. So we get e to the i x is cosine x plus i sine x. This is extremely useful. So why is this useful? You can derive all of trig from this. e to the i x times e to the minus i x is e to the 0, right? And what is e to the 0? 1. So this is cosine x plus i sine x times cosine x minus i sine x. And I'm using e to the i, sorry, e to the minus i x is cosine x 
plus i sine negative x. But because cosine is even, cosine of negative x is just cosine of x, and cosine is odd, sine of negative x is just negative sine of x. So this is just cosine x minus i sine x. All right, well, when I expand this out, I get cosine squared x plus i sine cosine minus i sine cosine, so that cancels. And what's i sine x times minus i sine x? It's plus sine squared. Do you recognize this? Cosine squared x plus sine squared x equals 1. Let's do another one. e to the i x, e to the i y is e to the i x plus y. So cosine x plus i sine x times cosine y plus i sine y is cosine x plus y plus i sine x plus y. So we get cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y. I'm just doing the real part. And when I have two complex numbers and I multiply, I'm just keeping the ones that are real. Everything else has an i, so I'll pull that out, and I'll have sine x cosine y plus cosine x sine y. Well, the only way two complex numbers can be equal is they have to have the same real parts and they have to have the same imaginary parts. So what does this have to equal? So what is cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y? What does that have to equal? Cosine what? Cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y. You know, this came, it's cosine x plus y. Right? We have this equal sign over here. Right? Because they're equal, the only way that it can happen is the real parts have to be the same. We've just proved the angle addition formula for cosine. And what about the other part? That has to be the sine of x plus y. So here's your trick. You can get half angle identities and stuff like this. This is where all these trig identities come from. They're inherited from the exponential function. The last thing I want to do, and then we'll call it a day, is let's say I want the degree four Taylor series of e to the x squared at, yeah, let's just do the degree eight Taylor series of e to the x squared. Do you want to keep taking derivatives of e to the x squared? Because when you take derivatives, you're going to have to start using the product rule. I know e to the u is 1 plus u plus u squared over 2 factorial plus u cubed over 3 factorial plus u to the fourth over 4 factorial plus dot dot dot. So e to the x squared is 1 plus x squared plus x to the fourth over 2 factorial plus x to the sixth over 3 factorial plus x to the eighth over 4 factorial plus higher order terms. And we're done. So because we knew the Taylor series expansion for e to the u, if you now want me to expand e to the x squared, let me just expand e to the u and substitute the u as x squared. So we'll do more about this next time. We'll continue to do you know, another lecture on Taylor series. There's a lot of problems in his own, the order of 15 problems to do for Taylor series. You want to start doing some of them now. Make sure when you hand them in, you do the problems in order. So if there's a problem that you don't know how to do for a while, just leave some space.